Welcome Hacking HR. Are you ready for a future of work with tech focus day? I have two that are going to panelists that are going to light your fire today with excitement, with use cases and such great contemporary thought leadership and innovation for today. Welcome to the future of work from the C-suite. My name is Jen Phillips Kirkwood. I'm the Vice President of the Future of Work with ADP. And as I said, I have got two very special panelists joining me today. Before I introduce them though, I am so excited to be joined and watching the panel and LinkedIn streaming with current panelists or current uh, friends from the past with Hacking HR and new friends, 10,000 of you rock stars that are rejoining us, which is just so exciting seeing the power of this Hacking HR network. Loving seeing these colleagues return. So we wanna see your ideas, not just where you are from, but your ideas and how we hack this community and keep the thought leadership going. But before we start, a couple of must heard questions and answers that you all can want to know. So one, the replays of these videos will be out in two to four weeks. Yes, two to four weeks on YouTube. And trust me, if you can't take notes fast enough to hear these two uh, speakers today, you will want to have this video. Above all, you will want to have this video. Also, you want to know about the education credits. Those will be shared next week in email with those codes. That's 30 Society for Human Resource Management and 23.5 HRCI credits. So those will be coming and shared next week with the codes. Um, the breakout sessions will continue after this today and you'll be able to in about 15 minutes afterwards join those. So now before we get to our guests, let me get you and give you some trivia for today. So here's your trivia as you join us. I want you to think about the C-suite that you work for today. I want you to think about the other C-suites that you work with with your colleagues. And I want you to ask yourself, what percentage of the C-suite globally do you think is ready for the future of work? There are analysts and there are studies that have been done and they have reported on what percentage do you think are ready for the future of work? Think about that, and I wanna hear you weigh in on the chatter with the percentage you think is ready. So now, over to our panelists as you weigh in. First off, our guest today, Gary Bowles. Gary is the chair for the future of work with Singularity University. He lectures around the world and writes about strategies for individuals, organizations, communities, and countries to thrive in a world of exponential change. And are we not in a world of exponential change? Yes, we are. He has nine courses on LinkedIn early. Personally, I've taken them, awesome. Um, and they're on subjects ranging from the new rules of work and developing adaptive managers. You've gotta check them out. As I said, they're fascinating and I've enjoyed the richness of, richness of. He also has written a book, which he didn't include in his bio, called What Color Is My Parachute? Next up, Mandy Sebel, Siebel um, joins us from New York headquarters of UiPath, where she is Chief People Officer. Our sweet C-suite has joined us. She has a great perspective on bookending her career in one of the dot-com pioneers in e-business and now at UiPath. Number one in the 2019 on the Deloitte Fast 500, UI is championing, championing a robot for every person and enabling robots to learn new skills through artificial intelligence, AI, and ML. Do you think we're talking bots today? Use cases, AI, and let me tell you guys, right from the headlines of your news last night, she's talking contemporary use cases. And if you are not getting that pencil ready to hear the use cases today and write them down, I'm telling you, get it ready. Welcome, Gary and Mandy. Thank Thanks, you so Jen. Really appreciate it. I love seeing the percentages that are coming in from this uh, audience today, Gary. Like I'm seeing the the, the percentages right now for, across the world, from 10% to 20%. Well done, Nicole. Uh, I'm seeing the 10%. She's uh, spot on from the trivia question. The global analysts from Deloitte to McKinsey to ADP Research Institute are spot on in saying it's between nine to 10% of organizations, which is so 
low, and we talk about future of work all the time, you would think it would be higher than that. So, you know, talk to me about that. Why is it only nine to 10% of organizations in C-suite are ready for the future of work? Well, first off, Jen, thanks for the, the introduction. That's uh, very, very, very uh, much appreciate uh, all the uh, background. Uh, just one minor correction. Uh, what Colors Your Parachute is actually written by my father, Dick Bowles, who was a recovering yeah. minister. Yes. And, uh, but I was training his methods when I was 19. So, um, and, uh, and he left behind a wonderful legacy, I think, for the, for the world. Um, so what I talk about in terms of preparation, um, you know, uh, prep surveys like this, is, it's, it's really about what I, the, sort of the combination of mindset and skill set. So the mindset is, do you feel that you have in the C-suite the right kind of mental preparation and the right framing and understanding of the issues that need to be addressed? And then the skill set is, do you actually feel that you can execute on it? And the reason I think that that number is, is breathtakingly low is that it's actually showing just a level of uncertainty in that there's, there's these various domains for the future of work. And, um, and I think what we've all sort of gotten the memo on is that this isn't really just about the future, although um, because the, we live in a world of exponential change, we want to be able to prepare for that uh, uh, rapid um, response to uh, exponential technologies and changes in markets down the road, but it's really about how we prepare ourselves today. And so it's perfectly understandable when the fog down the highway is so thick about what work is becoming, uh, that that's, people in the C-suite are not quite clear exactly, they don't have the mindset yet about how to be able to continuously adapt, and they don't have the skill set to be able to help their talented uh, workers to be able to do that. Interesting. So we have so many different colleagues that are joining us today. I wonder if they're in a position of persuasion and they're trying to manage up and coach the C-suite or they're here in terms of like they're ready, but their C-suite isn't. What advice would you give them? So um, I think the, the, we're at a unique time in history where the, um, there's a tremendous opportunity um, for HR leaders to be able to help the organization across the board and especially the C-suite to develop that mindset and that skill set. And uh, if there's any sort of core underpinning, it's, the, it's to get the memo that, that we will need to continually adapt. Um, the, you know, these, these, I, I talk about four domains and you mentioned them briefly, but um, individuals, organizations, communities, and countries and at each one of those levels there are challenges and opportunities that we need to address we need to be able to continually adapt as individuals our organizations need to be continually adaptive the communities in which we live are going through pretty substantial changes especially related to work and countries have policies and other processes that they're trying to adapt and so i think that hr leaders have the capacity to be able to help C-suite leaders to be able to see these changes and the, the changes are actually if we just see them as disruption I think then we get pretty nervous but if we see them as relatively predictable market shifts that is the market uh, uh, related to work is going to work differently in the future then we can actually see the bright red lines and uh, and HR leaders have the opportunity to be able to help C-suite to be able to manage that. You know, I really like this question from Martin out there. So understand, folks, that your voice gets heard with our panelists, and we're going to riff a bit to incorporate your questions. And I'd also ask that the community answer the questions of Martin and others. What changes does the C-suite see happening in the business environment that impact work? work? Gary, do you want to take this, and then we'll transition to Mandy? Okay, good. No, I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Mandy, too. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so we talk a lot about uh, disruption, disruptive technologies, disruptions in markets, and um, and again, if we if we just see them as completely unpredictable, what are you know what the seem to love calls black swans, then you know we can feel like we there's there's no way for us to be able to not not really predict, but to be able to continually adapt. And so, uh, probably one of the, the greatest ways to think about this is that um, the the behavior of consumers, the behaviors of markets is going to continually shift based on access to technology, based on these, what we call exponential technologies that are going to have a dramatic reshaping, um, what, uh, what my friend John Hagel at Deloitte calls the big shift in markets. But the truth is that um, those are often pretty predictable sort of, you know, as John calls them, unbundling. There are processes by which technologies are changing how markets uh, work, 
and the ways in which consumers and businesses, uh, customers are, are behaving. And so the more we can help the talent function of the organization to be able to deliver the people that are able to anticipate those changes and respond rapidly to adapt to those changes, then HR will have done its business. Um, and it, it'll, it'll serve its purpose and it will help the organization to be able to be that adaptive business that is going to be able to continually solve the problems of tomorrow. All right, so let me transition over to, to Mandy for a second. Thanks, Gary. So today's, Mandy, today's hacking HR theme is all based on technology today. And I know this audience is really hungry to hear from you. I'm seeing some of the inline comments. So what's interesting is that globally, 60% of HR systems are not integrated. Furthermore, in terms of Internet of Things and IoT, it's predict projected to have 75 billion, with a B, devices connected by 2025. So our systems aren't integrated, but IoT is abundant according to Statistica. So as we think about from the C-suite lens, the need in the new world of work to connect our work, the workforces, and leverage automation where we can, certainly, what is in the C-suite considering an automation? I mean, certainly from the business lens, and we look at Lego and, and some of what they've done that's quite remarkable and all over the press lately. What are you seeing from the new world of work and where are the opportunities there to really drive automation? And perhaps you can give some business automation ideas from even a contemporary lens. Yeah, no, I, thank you so much and thank you for having me. Um, and uh, Gary, it's just so interesting to listen to you. I think uh, just knowing how diverse the people on the phone are, mm -hmm. um, I thought I'd even just maybe break down what um, robotic process automation is, really what my company does. And I think when you talk about like, number of systems that are you know not even connected maybe even where we start to play right so um, RPA is really simple it's uh, software robots that can you know execute mundane tasks and it's as simple as that and they can take away all the repetitive work that people do all day long um, uh, you know it basically you know they learn what you're doing on the screen and they and they make it go away and so when you think about um, connecting people and systems. I mean, I just think about all the HR practitioners that are out there that are in the midst of a workday migration or they're trying to figure out how to connect, you know, their new recruitment tools and, you know, you don't have the mind share of the IT teams to, you know, to focus on this. You know, RPA, you know, can, can be that connective tissue. And then where RPA um, creates a gateway for AI and machine learning is it just, um, it, it, you know, it's almost like a, a layer that allows systems to get more connected and to get smarter. Um, but I also think, you know, even though it's so simple to think about, or at least it's simple for me because I work amongst, you know, so many talented professionals that are bringing our customers to the forefront of, of automation, um, you know, what does it mean, you know, for the average company or, or user? So, you know, banks are using RPA to check internal and external, you know, databases to monitor a suspicious activity. You know, we all worry about, um, you know, security and, and items like that. HR uses robots. You know, if you think about the, uh, you know, the onboarding processes that we have in companies, especially when you're in a global multinational company and there's, you know, very different, um, you know, systems and tools and paperwork and uh, data that needs to be entered. You know, this is just a, a tremendous use of an, of an HR leader's workforce. We can automate those very basic and mundane tasks. Uh, we connect, can connect the systems that do that. So imagine all the onboarding paperwork, you know, the entering of social security numbers and things like that into a payroll system. You can just take it away from the people and it makes it more accurate. And then it really frees up your team to do things that are more interesting, creative, and frankly, to think about all these very complex issues that we're talking about today. Um, so I think where uh, we feel very fortunate um, uh, as an organization is that we're watching our customers, not all of them, like you said, only 10% you know, of the C-suite is ready for this, right? So we've spent a lot of time um, helping to pave the way for what this, um, what automation means and what automation is. We spend a lot of time educating, a lot of time preparing the workforce, um, both our own and others. Um, but we are, uh, we feel very, you know, um, fortunate to see the applications. And 
when I think about the, the people on the phone today and you asked for a bit of a use case, um, I mean, is there one HR practitioner on the phone here today that isn't watching the news by the minute around the coronavirus? I mean, I've become an, um, uh, an expert, which is terrifying, right? But it keeps me up at night. You know, we have 3,000 people across the globe, um, many of whom are in APAC where this first began. And, you know, our, our colleagues are, you know, working from home. They're working at customer sites. They're, you know, in God knows what airports, you know, around the globe. And, um, you know, that is a heavy weight for a CHRO of an organization. And we don't really have a playbook for, for situations like this. Um, so, you know, very interestingly, you know, whereas, you know, you talk about the mindset of the C-suite, my mindset went very quickly to some very, you know, traditional things. How do we communicate? What do we say? Business contingency planning. <laughs> my colleagues in China uh, went right for RPA, and they have created um, essentially a tracking tool because we have to monitor the health and wellness and the, you know, the, the temperatures of people in that marketplace. It's, you know, it's government mandated. And we've made tools like that available um, out on our uh, community resources where anyone who's um, able to or has to track this type of situation right now is able to go download and do that, right? So RPA is very accessible. Um, and, you know, we have this, you know, very interesting situation here where we have, you know, creative technologists in the organization, team members that are working really rapidly to, to figure out how to be solving these issues in more constructive ways while we're also thinking about regular business continuity and how to, how to um, you know, communicate and focus on the welfare of our team. So that's what we're up to here today at uh, UiPath. So if I can just stop and summarize for a minute, and the reason I'm smiling and looking aside is I'm trying to catch up with the LinkedIn comments, at which you can't see and Gary can't see right now, but we're getting questions on the coronavirus and the applicability from RPA on the coronavirus. And, and just for complete clarity, the robotic process automation is RPA. Um, and there's many different methods of the automation, um, business process management and AI. There's lots of different techniques around that that folks have related to. Would it be fair to say, from your perspective, that RPA is leveraged from the business end, but that 9% that you're talking about in terms of you know trying to reach for it and really trying to make that reality is tough right now to get it in the hands of CHROs to make that applicable for the new world of work. That's where you're seeing the challenge. Yeah, I you know I don't know if it's um, if it's tough. I think we're um, uh, you know we're you know we're trying to make uh, this more accessible to people understand how they can use tools um, and you know because of our you know, situation where we create these products for, for customers, we're, we're trying to put it in the hands of other organizations so they can, they can uh, access it more easily, right? Um, but I think uh, one of the reasons RPA has uh, been adopted so quickly by organizations and why it is one of the, um, you know, RPA and AI are the top priorities of CEOs today is because it does create this uh, quick accessibility solves for business issues and drives transformation. So I think we have uh, we have accessibility. I think C-suite leaders, CHROs today, um, can really help to think about leading this transition and transformation. And I do think though in the moment where we have something acute like coronavirus, not everyone's as fortunate as we are to have some of these tools and we're just very eager to make things available to those that want it. You know, I'm seeing a lot of comments in terms of, does it matter where the HR function from Steve? Uh, Shapiro, uh, does it matter where the HR function reports directly to either the CEO, COO, CFO? Because what I'm translating from there, and, and certainly where we sometimes see the challenge, and Gary, I'd love your comment on this too with Mandy, is making it a business transformation issue. And that's the key word I keep hearing from you is making it a business issue. Corona has been a business issue. Yeah. But making it an everyday business issue, and Gary, I know you talk about HR getting a seat at the table, or amplifying their voice at the seat at the table. Making it a business issue has not always been easy for HR. So when you think about the future of work and 9% of those business organizations being ready for the future of work, how do we make things a business issue? And I don't know as to whether HR has always, one, gotten the support they've needed, and certainly in something like RPA, how do they garner IT support in being made a priority and not a backlog item? What are your thoughts on that? Sorry, do you want me to? Either one. Either uh, one. Okay. 
I'll, I'll, I'll dive in and then Danny, I'd love to hear your thoughts, especially because you're, you're in the trenches. You're, you're, you're the one that's let's doing go. it. Let's so. get in the trenches because uh, the comments that are coming in are, are all over the board and kind of asking about that. Like Corona's yeah. great. It made the headlines. It made it everybody's problem. But what yeah. if it's a non-Corona type of issue and everyone would love to lean in, but they're not getting the resources or are getting that kind of priority. So many, actually, I'd love to hear from you, you know, because you, you are in that role. I mean, how do you think, where do you think the, the um, optimal way? Yeah, that so I think what we see from customers today is, you know, very often um, when you think about automation, you know, I think, you know, people think about automation, they often think about cost savings. That's usually where, where things start, right? That's not new, right? That has nothing to do with RPA or AI. Um, so what we, what we often see, is, and when you think about where highly automatable processes are in organizations, they are often in the CFO's organization. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, I'm okay with that. I think it's fantastic, right? So um, if the CFO sees value in um, automation and transformation and starts that cycle, um, you know, I'm a very fast, um, you know, if I think about my own company or if I think about other companies that I've been the CHRO in, um, I'm a very fast partner to those people because I want to, one, um, ride their coattails for my own department, right, where maybe I don't have the budget or I don't, haven't had the uh, opportunity to have, you know, be leading the edge on, on technology per se, right? I think uh, many, many CHROs, you know, are not dying to sign up for a global HRIS implementation, right? It's probably not going to make you famous, right? So um, so I think from a C-suite standpoint, if you can be the partner to a CIO, a CIO or a CFO or, or the business um, center of excellence that's driving some of the automation and change um, really quickly, you can have massive impact in your organization. And that's, I think, what Gary was talking about when we talked about talent transformation. You know, you have to prepare people for you know, um, unfortunately, the anxiety that comes with automation, very quickly people fear job loss. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we see something a little bit differently. Uh, we see automation actually just freeing up bandwidth for people to do work that's more creative and more interesting. And, you know, um, most companies are not over-resourced with people. So I think there's an opportunity um, to partner really closely here. I do think there's an opportunity if you happen to be a, a, a C HRO who has an opportunity to drive uh, their own automation to take the lead on that, or even to bring some of these very complex topics about, you know, reskilling to the forefront of your organization. I think there's different ways to attack it. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, if anything, it, uh, it, it gives you a real voice in the business, but I think HR has a real voice in the business. So let me just, I, I really appreciate that, especially because you, you see so many different um, HR leaders as well. Um, so, so I'm actually a recovering journalist. So I was uh, in the 1990s. I was uh, I was the editorial director for five different technology publications. And in the early 90s, I would sit down with um, CIOs uh, and and heads of IT at the time were asking very similar questions. How can I have a seat at the table? How can I, you know, how can I be strategic IT? How, you know, and today we don't even question that, right? I mean, we know that technology can enable the business. Agreed. Um, but but I, I hear echoes of those same sorts of questions with a lot of um, HR leaders. And, uh, and so uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. So, so the, the, the first is that um, the, the question about a seat at the table is, is actually to me less, less valuable than, than to think about it in a completely different framing. So we're at a unique period in time where we are literally rewriting the rules for work. We're rewriting the rules for organizations. And in 10 years, 15 years, many organizations are not going to function in the old command and control model. They're going to be much more adaptive. They're going to be much more flexible. More and more managers are going to be empowered to shift from the, the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. More and more work groups are going to be very dynamic and dynamically bind around problems. More and more workers are going to be using what I call a portfolio of work with a range of different projects and areas of focus. And so if we, if we see all of that as being the future, um, then then I'd say to, to HR leaders, well, well, actually, for, forget about having a seat at the table. You need to create a new table. You need to have the mentality that what we're doing is uh, we are actually redefining those rules in ways that will enable the talent of the organization to continually solve the problems of today and tomorrow. And so, so I would say um, work mechanically is just three things. It's our human skills applied to uh, tasks 
to solve problems. And so what RPA does is it essentially is automating those tasks. And the more repetitive the tasks are, then uh, often those are the ones then, you know, we can, we can free up uh, human beings. Now, now, unfortunately, you know, a completely freed up human being we call unemployed. <laughs> so it takes the organization to be able to have the processes by which it's continually helping people to be able to uh, focus on new, solving new problems and, um, and being able to continually adapt themselves uh, to become lifelong learners and to be able to have that skill set. But, but I think if, if mechanically it's our human skills applied to tasks to solve problems, spiritually what, what work is, is the channeling of human energy. And, and HR leaders have the opportunity to be able to completely redefine the processes by which the humans, the, the talented people, are continually channeling their energy to solve the problems of today and tomorrow. And we, we're still reshaping these old rules of uh, hierarchical structured organizations, command and control, and we just know those are not going to transfer into the future. And so, so we're, we're trying to fix the car as we're rolling down the highway at 90, 90 miles an hour. I think HR leaders can reframe these issues for other C-suite leaders and for managers and, and workers within the organization, how they can become much more empowered problem solvers, especially creative problem solvers. And tools like RPA are simply going to enable them to be able to focus on the problems that can use their human skills better, to be able to, to be that, uh, that creative problem solver. Yeah, so Gary, I would probably just build on, I was just listening to you talk and uh, something popped to mind. So um, so first of all, uh, I think about the gentleman here who I work with, who's our uh, chief learning officer, right? So his, you know, when he came in the door here um, from a very successful career in, in predominantly sales enablement, that's what his background is. So, you know, we're, we were a startup company, we we're 300 people in 2018, we grew to 3,000 people over the past two years, you know, candidly, I wasn't myself, he, we weren't thinking about, um, you know, all this automation and innovation. We were thinking about how to hire people and get them in the door. This is yeah. basic practitioner stuff yeah. and how to get them ramped really quickly and productive so that we could go do what our enterprise software sales to our customers, right? That's, we have all the classic business problems that everyone else around, the, around this, uh, this session likely has, right? Um, but I think about where he spends his time uh, a year and a half later. And uh, he, as an example, um, and you think about the way that way the roles are changing, the way the work is changing, um, he's leading our academic alliance program. So we have uh, not only training our team members and onboarding them and all the classic ways that you do and drive sales enablement and teach people how to you know, pitch customers and you know, uh, get productive quickly, and, but we're also training our partners on how to sell what we do. And then we're working with, um, you know, with the university. So when you think about preparing the future of work, you know, we have an academic alliance program that is uh, working with, I think, over 400 universities across 33 countries, where we're essentially bringing these tools into university systems so they can think about how their curriculum has to change. How do they prepare people to come out of university in four years and get to work? Trust me that that was not what he was you know, thinking when he walked in the door here, right? So that's how rapidly jobs are changing. Um, and I, so I think that's, that's one just example of how, um, you know, people will think differently about their classic roles and, and certainly our learning officer is doing that. Um, I think the second thing I thought about while you were talking was, um, uh, you know, you have, you, you know, you have so many early career people today that won't take a job in a company if they have to do this type of, you know, a lot of, um, you know, low end mundane work, right? So this is another classic, you know, problem we've been talking about for, you know, years now. How do you, you know, find great talent? How do you identify great talent? How do you retain great talent? You know, you, you have no choice as, a, as an HR practitioner or a talent strategist or whatever we call ourselves, um, but to think about these things. And so I think when you, when, you know, this proverbial seat at the table, it's, it's part of your job right now to think about how to bring in automation to the organization in whatever form it is so that you can, um, you can have people stay with organizations longer. No, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned the, the chief learning officer and especially the learning functions because we, we see this as being just critical. Um, uh, you know, I spent a bunch of time with leaders from uh, the um, company Novartis, 100,000 employees last year, and, and they've got 
two, two processes that I'm a big fan of. One is that they are on a, on a forced march to become a learning organization. So there's tremendous incentives for people to be able to continue to learn on an ongoing basis. I'm, I'm actually not a big fan. I would, I would urge our listeners to, to reevaluate using words like reskilling and upskilling. Those kind of sound like the, the, the automated or the, um, the industrial era processes that we're kind of trying to leave behind. Um, I think training's great. Uh, but the, the opportunity for organizations is, as, as you're continually needing a new skill set, is to help existing workers to be able to learn that skill set just in time and just in context. So one of the ways that learning is changing in the organization and, and to enable the, the future of work is rather than saying, oh, I'm going to go back and get a four-year degree in X, <laughs> um, what can I learn? What, what do I need to know to be able to solve the problem that's in front of me and be able to do it? just as I need it in time and do it in context, in the context of the work that I'm doing. And so I think that's a tremendous opportunity for organizations is to build that kind of flexible fabric. Uh, the other process that Novartis is using is, is uh, what they call unbossing. What can you do to help empower the worker so that they understand the problems that they're trying to solve? They're actually in a collaborative process for defining the problems that they're trying to solve. And, um, and that, that manager then becomes much more of a guide to help them to be able to most effectively as a team to be able to solve those problems. And in the era of coronavirus and, and other shocks to the system, that again, that command and control structure, the, you know, we, we're simply not going to be prepared for the next black swan or the next big shock to the system if we don't continually encourage people to be empowered to be able to become creative, creative problem solvers. Yeah, I think that's right. And what we're seeing um, both internally and with some of our more um, adoptive customers is, you know, the, the rise of the citizen developer, right? So all these great ideas, you know, the notion of putting a, a robot on every desktop here, um, which is, you know, really part of our, our you know, mission as an like organization. And we want everyone to, you know, for this technology to be as accessible to somebody as, you know, Microsoft Excel is, right? Um, but you know, a lot of the innovation, a lot of the business movement is co is coming from the individuals that see their, um, you know, see where there are opportunities, see where they don't want to do the work any longer. Um, we have a, a customer that is in the professional services business, and for any of you who've worked in that industry, you know, you have to track time and attendance because you're billable. You know, how much that is the, one of the most annoying chores for for these folks, right? And you know, they had. They implemented this bot as one of the high, most highly adopted bots that they had initially, and it you know kind of took away people's fears, right? This is a, a task no one wants to do, and it's a part of their everyday business, right? And so we just see that the the individual when you put it when you put things in the hands of the individual when you unbox the situation like you're describing, you just see innovation take off, and we certainly appreciate that internally, um, you know, and and are seeing it in our customers, and you know. For you and I, who you know been in industry a while, you know I talk about the reverse internship all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, people want to know how to get to the C-suite. I want to know how to use some of the technology, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. No, it's it's funny you should mention professional services automation. I was actually a chief operating officer for a software company in 1995 um, that was the first professional services automation firm and uh, uh, built software for that for that market. And, uh, but, but I use the example of consulting organizations all the time because they do this. They, they are project centric. They're very much around creative problem solving. They dynamically bind around problems. They're managing multiple projects simultaneously. You know, these have a lot of the characteristics of the way that work is shifting. Even what used to be thought of as very, you know, relatively mundane parts of the organization. So reality check here. I'd love to get in the voice of our audience for just a, a minute to kind of calibrate the amazing future of work ideas and then some things that sometimes are the reality pieces that the organizations challenge them with. Uh, the citizen developer, we absolutely agree that the citizen developer role is so important. The caveat to that is IT does challenge or tech does challenge back with the average cost of a data breach is $3.92 million. That's the going rate for a data breach. So the thoughtfulness, the curation of that is something we have to balance in who in the right hands or the right partner in you know, somebody like with your company, Mandy, um, the thoughtfulness and the curation of that. The skills gap, Gary, to your point, the reskilling and upskilling and the thoughtfulness of where do we place a bot 
is so needed um, by 2030, it's projected that globally the skills gap is going to be 20 million in jobs from a skills gap perspective. So back to your initial point, Mandy, how a bot um, sounds really impressive, but it can help just re undo or help perform those mundane tasks. It can be so helpful. So I think that education is so critical and we're seeing that from our audience. So I'd love to share with you a lot of comments. I mean, this is an extremely rich audience um, capture that I'm seeing more than I think ever. And I'd love to share with you kind of putting the human back into the organization. So Peter is sharing, currently the trend is to rebrand HR people something. How about the alternative of using HP as in human potential, something we should cultivate people, talent, and engagement. Um, everybody really got some chuckles over, Gary, your comments on recovering journalist. Just had to share that with you. Um, that was quite a hit. The newest role from Valerie, in many C-suites is a CDO, Chief Data Officer. And the question was, and I'll pause on this question, are you seeing the emergence of CDOs? And what is the partnership between CHRO and CDO for critical areas like AI and analytics? So I'll, I'll pose that to you. And Mandy, maybe we can start with you on that. Yeah, so I think when I, uh, when I reflect on, um, uh, you know what ha what what is happening what is changing in the workforce when you bring in you know AI and ML and whatever other sundry of automation era technologies are out there um, you know you you will have a lot of um, access to to data in an organization right so I, I uh, well I haven't personally maybe reflected on on the, that specific role per se I think the notion of data analytics Corporate responsibility for um, for the information that you have is a is a evolving space for for you know general counsels and uh, security officers and HR officers and the entire C suite. And um, there's a lot of responsibility that comes. You know, um, we've talked ad nauseum these past few years around uh, using AI to eliminate bias in hiring and things like that. Uh, but I do think some of the balance that comes to the C-suite, despite the, the irrelevant of the role, is how to use all this how, how to use all this data and how to balance it with some of the empathy that comes with a changing workforce. So I could see the, that role really emerging for sure, but I'm imagining it's already in large multinational companies where they're sitting on all this data today. Um, but I could see that being a very close partnership. How do you use this data? How do you use it intelligently? What are the concerns that team members have when you're you know, able to you know, study work patterns or um, trends of customers? Uh, so I, I, could, I could see why that question is coming up. But Gary, what would we add to that? Yeah, so no, I think it's I think it's a great point. Um, so I use the analogy um, with with uh, the way that we think about uh, data. Um, I'm actually finishing up a piece uh, called Childhoods End uh, for my friend uh, David Kirkpatrick at uh, Techonomy, um, uh, an article. And and my, my basic thesis is when when you have a um, a business model that uh, has at its most, uh, its deepest underpinning, has some processes by which you manage data that encourages you to do things that put data at risk, especially people's personal data, uh, customer data. Um, it's it's kind of similar to the way we used to think about uh, pollution spills. You know, you, 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 if, you, you if the data breaches that you were talking about, Jen, you know, think of that as, as like a, you know, just a big oil spill or a big, you know, big spill of pollution into a stream. And, and the problem was not so much that you were polluting, it's that you had processes that you needed to back up to and say, well, wait a minute, why are we even creating this pollution in the first place? And so I think it's really important, I encourage business decision makers to just back up and say, wait a minute, what are the responsibilities that we have around this information? And how do we make sure that our business model encourages us to be great stewards of that information? It's critical because what ends up happening otherwise is you create incentives. Um, you know, as, as a recovering journalist, we used to basically smear ink on dead trees and uh, and ship it out to people based on their interests. You know, I could I could uh, use that content to gather attention. Well, that that model has been weaponized, and so one of the reasons we have such great challenges now when we think about online ads and social media ads and that sort of thing is that that process inevitably leads to ways to be able to make money that can put society at more risk. 
And so it's really important to step back and look at your internal data processes and ensure that you are actually, your, your business model and your approach to managing that information creates all the right incentives to be able to handle it responsibly. So. Um, I agree. I'd also add to that from our experience where we see the greatest transformation in the C-suite, the greatest um, propelling. And I think we've asked for, we've gotten asked for many use cases of where we've seen things go right. So I can see some hunger out in our audience where we're seeing HR wants help. That's some of the, the voice and in, in some of the audience questions that we're getting. Give me some examples of where HR got some help in transformation. You, it will be very difficult to make transformation is what we've seen. It's very difficult for HR to make transformation in the C-suite without the help of their technology partner. That when you can have those business questions answered with the technology partner at your side and helping steward through the protocols, the help, not just throwing out a lot of different citizen developers, but without the right curation there and the right technology partner. When you have the right business questions answered, you have the right why as the root cause in answering those questions, and you have your technology partner by your side, they prioritize you because you're now aligned to the business questions. You get things done. Going rogue and trying to get it done without IT doesn't work. And we see a lot of that too. And we see a lot of the failures there in transformation. I think that's my guidance. We have a lot of people avoid IT. It doesn't work. You've got to work with your IT partners because of the breaches, because of the risks. So it's either, I, I, my guidance is either bless it or break it. You either work with tech and you build a business case up front or they break it at the end. I always think of the Lego analogy. <laughs> you know, Jen, I also wanted to address, uh, you'd mentioned one of the questions was around things like the skills gap. And um, so yeah. one, one you know, sort of different perspective I'd like to offer is, um, so, so I, I mentioned I was, was trained as a career counselor when I was 19. I was never very interested in college, which, which makes it quite ironic that I would talk about things like the future of education. Um, but just go with it. So, so, uh, so, so it tur it turns out that as as humans, we have sort of two basic groupings of skills. We've got knowledges, which is the bodies of information that we gather, and then we have these things called transferable skills, skills usable in a range of different situations. And we we sometimes call those traits. You know, other times they're they're skills that are that are functional, that are usable in different situations to solve a range of different problems, but. But we're at, a, I think, a unique time in human history where we're starting to understand more and more about human skills. But I'm going to make a couple of quick contentions that I think are true for many organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, contention number one, we, we, we as humans don't know our own skills. Like we don't actually have a clear understanding of the kinds of problems that we can best solve. And we especially don't understand our superpowers. Like we, we think that everybody can do the things that we can do that, you know, that are that are often so amazing in terms of being able to solve specific kinds of problems. The organization doesn't know the skill set that it has. There's a, I always use it, an image of an iceberg and I show the tip, you know, and so, um, so one of the things I, I, would, I would strongly encourage HR leaders to be thinking about how can you uncover what's under the surface of the water? Um, if you want a, a, a great book, um, Kelly Stephen Weiss has a new, new book coming out called the, the Inside Gig, and she's a CHRO at, at here, but uh, technologies, but what she's talked about is how do you go about uncovering, helping individuals to uncover those skills, and then this whole idea of a skills gap, well, the truth is you can try to reduce the delta between the skills you need in the future and the kinds of skills that you have internally, and if you're a much more adaptive organization that helps people to be able to understand what those problems to solve are, they can become more directionally focused. And I think this speaks exactly to what you were talking about with, with, in terms of the young people coming in. Um, uh, the stack that we typically talk about for work is, you know, what can you get paid for? Uh, and then it's, you know, oh, if you're good at it, you get paid better. And then if it's, uh, well, actually, what, what am I good at? What do I love doing? And then to some extent, some people will eventually find, you know, what does the world need? Well, the Japanese call that ikigai. And young people are flipping the stack. They come in, the, they walk in the door and say, what's your organization's purpose? What, what it, what's the problem in the world you're trying to solve? Well, if I'm doing that, then I'm going to love it. And if I love it, I'm going to get better and better at it. And then I'll get paid well for it as well. And so the more we can help people to understand their own skills, the kinds of problems that they best love to solve, 
the more we can especially help that younger worker to start to flip the stack. But everybody should be able to do that. Should, they should be able to figure out what are they driven towards? What's the purpose that they feel or the meaning in the work that they do? And then what are the skills that, that they often don't know to be able to bring to bear on those problems? Talk about putting the human back in work. You know, that reminds me, uh, Mandy, when I think about the skills gap and how RPA helps the skills gap, I know you've got a really fascinating use case around the skills gap and what you did in the aging workforce. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and uh, so much of what Gary was just saying resonates, I think, um, so we can, we, can, we can come there too. So uh, we have a, a customer, one of our earliest uh, uh, customers in Japan, it's a, it's a financial institution, um, that, uh, and I know you have uh, on the phone here today, um, or uh, yeah. participating, you know, people from all over APAC likely. Um, so the aging workforce in Japan is a, is a major societal problem, right? Uh, the number of people retiring, the lack of people coming into the job market, the difficulty of, um, you know, identifying earlier career people that want to do the work that was out there. So we have, um, we do have a customer who is a very early adopter of our own technology. Um, but I think even in small ways, you know, this resonates to people who are just thinking about retention in their own organizations or solving for talent gaps and skill gaps. Um, so, so initially, you know, they brought in a lot of the technology to, um, you know, reduce drive automation to reduce man hours of doing mundane work. But what they're also really solving for at the same time is, is the retiring workforce. And the fact that there's only just a, 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 there's a more narrow portion of people available to do work. So if you're able to automate a lot of work that might have been done by earlier career people or, uh, in, you know, you know, or, or whoever is available in the society to do work, and then you're able to focus the work that matters with the available talent, you're solving this problem on both ends, right? So it's a, real, it's a really fascinating use case. Um, and I think uh, many, many of us know that societies like this also have very high pressure um, work climates, high suicide rates, you know, there's, there's a lot of socioeconomic fac uh, factors being solved when you're bringing in automation um, and you're enabling people to do work that does ultimately um, make them more happy, right? Mm -hmm. um, now that is a, uh, a really fascinating use case. It gets everybody here at the company excited. It gets our customers really excited and certainly it had a massive impact in, uh, in, in Japan. Um, but that's not an everyday example. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think, you know, you know, Gary, when I was listening to you talk, um, we here, you know, I work with a, a third party um, technology tool that, um, you know, happened to start in sort of the recruitment you know, space, helping to identify talent. But, you know, one of their early uh, use case adaptations and where they're sort of taking their platform is um, how do you, you know, how do you take the talent you have today? use some of the AI and, and talent pattern ma uh, mapping um, that's out there to uncover what people don't know about themselves, remove bias in the workplace, because instead of just, you know, you know the recency of calling the person who did the best job on the last thing, you're actually like uncovering um, skill sets that people have that they may not even know they have. And, you know, recruiting from within, which is becoming, you know, just really, really important. Uh, you know, uh, for organizations. This is an everyday problem, right? So I think there's, you know, these really interesting use cases that have societal impact and um, get people really, you know, who are mission driven and purpose driven, you know, really excited about the company that they work for. And then I think you also have a real opportunity to connect to this everyday issue of employee engagement, which, you know, has been around as, as long as we've all been in industry and think about how to really use talent that you have in an organization on what really exists and then yeah. to go their way into it. So the one thing that I would just throw in for that is I think that the the better we can develop these tools that can help us to understand our own skills, that can help us to be able to better integrate those skills with others in a team, I think is marvelous. Uh, if, if all we do is we create a better sort of Harry Potter sorting hat function, I don't know <laughs> if we've actually solved the, the problem appropriately, but if we're actually helping people have the information that they need so they can be continually goal driven, then I think uh, that's a that's a that's a win win for everybody. We know that, that what's interesting on that comment is we've gotten comments in the audience saying, basically alluding to the change management. And I think there was a Cap Gemini speaker on here that said, but have you ever come to the client, you talk all about the fantastic tools and that they still regress to their old tools. So do you, 
it, do you want to speak in kind of our closing few moments to how do you still help the change management and the adoption of these fabulous toys, as the Joker says, like how does Batman always get these fabulous toys? How do we get them to long lasting transform and make use of it? Because that's where the utilization of ROI come in. So let me just give you one quick point and then Andy, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So um, one of the LinkedIn courses that you mentioned, Jen, is, um, is um, I, I say change management is dead. It's all about management, managing change. Change management was about assessing the current state, designing a future state, looking at the delta between them and hitting go. Okay. I, I, we can't foresee a time where the, the exponential rate of change is gonna slow down. We just don't know. And so, so it is more about managing change. It's ongoing processes and the tool sets may change. What is critical is that people have the, the tools they need both uh, in terms of mindset and skill set. <laughs> Um, to be able to continually understand how they can solve problems. And if the, and the tool set is going to continually change, they've got to be able to manage that change on an ongoing basis. Andy? Yeah, and you know, uh, it's so interesting to, to hear Gary talk about this. I think you know, people are, are, are complex and simple all at the same time, right? So, um, you know, I, I'll just go back to my recruiting team and that's, you know, really just because we're such a high growth, we're such a high growth company. And that's a lot of where our emphasis was, um, you know, in the last two years, you, you can, you can bring in all the tools out there. And if, if people, you know, want to use what worked in the past, you know, they're still going to do that. So I think it, it isn't, um, any more, you know, simple in some ways than, you know, having some people who are early adopters, you know, letting them see the, letting other people see the impact. And then letting people see the way that their their own ability to impact their own careers changes. So I have a, a colleague in our team. Um, she was a very early adopter of some of the um, you know recruitment tools that are available out there. You know, I started my career as a recruiter. We had to you know go through phone books and build org charts and you know call our way to the person. You know now that you know that there's so much more out there today. Um, but people are still doing what I had to do in, in 1995. Um, and she, you know she was she really leaned in. You know you train the the tools to calibrate to look for talent the way you want it. Unearths talent you wouldn't have called in the first place. And you know very simple stuff. Her time to fill is faster. She spends less time looking, more time talking. That's where she gets her energy from. And we have better talent coming in the door as a result of it. So you know you you sometimes you have to um, you know showcase these these heat centers of talent and you know change comes especially if you have uh, people who are reticent for change okay so i think now we're, we're ready to wrap up based on the questions that are going on though now and getting heated here and asking about the recruiting piece we have a lot of recruiting people on the line so now that you've unveiled your past as a recruiting life and now, <laughs> and now at an ai and rpa firm mandy share with the audience the best way in closing on how to get in touch with you with the future in the future. Yeah, I know you can uh, find me on LinkedIn and you can find me at uh, Mandy Siebel at UiPath.com and I would encourage anybody out there also who may want to, um, you know, not necessarily uh, become a customer of UiPath, but, you know, play around with some of the technology. It's available to you. You can, you can join our academy. You can learn for free. You know, we, we want everyone to have access and if, uh, and if you, if you want to take up the time to do it, you can. You can automate simple things in your life. <laughs> um, so, welcome anybody to take advantage. And Gary, over to you. How would you like to connect? And last yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn, uh, please just follow me on LinkedIn. And then um, I've got all the articles and courses um, that I mentioned on uh, gbowles.com, G-B-O-L-L-E-S.com. Wonderful. All right. Well,